This is someone who is truly a kaleidoscope of a person. In case you didn't know, she's originally a lawyer. She was singing her way through the law degree, honours at Melbourne. She has since come, gone on to um, be a very successful businesswoman. Started many uh, years ago, Music Theatre Australia, which is now one of the Australia's top talent booking agencies. She's a social entrepreneur. Some years ago, she created Song Room, which is an incredible organisation, which we'll talk about. She's also a person who does not know how to stop. She went on to create Creativity Australia, um, which is, again, a story which she can tell. But uh, more importantly, for all of us in this room, we wouldn't be here unless she had created Creative Universe and had conceptualised the need for a conference on creative innovation in Australia. And she took the, uh, the guts to book this place without any speakers, without any sponsors, without any program, but she just booked it and said, we'll make it happen. And that's why we're all here. And then she lifted the phone one night to Edward de Bono or to his office in the first place in London and said, would you like to come? And he said, oh, I'm a bit past travel now. Don't like to do that. Well, maybe I could. I'll be there for a day, half a day. Well, if you may or may not know, he's now been here for three and a half days, plus two days last week. And we are very honoured to have had him here. And last night I was honoured to be at the concert and have Dame Elizabeth Murdoch here in this her, her hall, as well as Edward de Bono. None of these things would have happened without Tanya de Jong. Tanya, your thoughts, please. Oh. <clears throat> well, oh, I need my clicker, Rufus. Thank you so much. Um, I actually wanted to start off by talking about the power of no. You know how there's the power of yes? And I want to talk about the power of no. Because I've been told no so many times. And I've heard so much talk throughout this conference. And the reason why I set up my last two organisations, definitely Creativity Australia and Creative Universe, is because so many people said to me, you know, I feel like no one's listening to my ideas. People always say, we've always done it this way. This is the way we do things here. And there's no chance for my voice to be heard, especially in large organisations. And I do a lot of work with a lot of large corporates and, and other um, organisational institutions. And so, for me, I think I've been told no so many times, and what is it that makes me keep rising up to, to try again? Um, and just to give you an example, when I was 14, I desperately wanted to learn how to sing. But I did a lot of stuff at school, and Mum said, look, you're so busy doing you know, all your different activities, you know, just wait for a while. But I thought I had a pretty strong voice, and I went round to my best girlfriend's house, and she taught me a song. And at the end of the song, we went through it about four times, and she said, look, I'll play it for you on the piano now, and you just sing it. And so I sung the song. And she said, oh, look, I don't think you should ever bother having singing lessons. You're not good enough. Hmm. And so being a 14-year-old girl, I believed her. And so the next couple of years, I did backstage in the school musical. And finally, in year 11, I got up the courage to audition for Oklahoma, the chorus, and I got the lead role. My friend didn't get in the chorus. But the thing about it was that it was actually, I thought, well, this is what I really want to do. And it was at that moment I found my passion, as Charles so eloquently speaks about passion. But that wasn't the first or the only time that ever happened to me. And it is quite often people who are in leadership roles to us who will dampen our spirits and our enthusiasm often unwittingly um, or unknowingly as to what effect that's going to have on our capacity to continue. And so when I was 22, I started learning with one of the leading opera singers in Australia, and I felt so privileged to be learning with her. And she said to me, oh, you're one of the most talented singers I've ever worked with. This is wonderful. And I went off and, and went off to London on her recommendation to study with her teacher in London. And I came back, and then I went to another lesson with her. And then out of the blue, she says to me, oh, Tanya, I don't really think you should bother continuing with lessons. You're never going to make it past the chorus. And I thought, 
my goodness. And it took me all my energy not to burst out crying in the room right there and then. I had my accompanist there, and he remembers this to this very day. And I went out to the car, and I started crying. And I thought, I'm not, I can't do this anymore. This is just too hard. And I, I'm going to go and grow bananas in Byron Bay. It's just, this is just all too difficult. And um, so what happened was, for all these years, I sort of carried this sort of sense of, of this person who'd said this to me. And occasionally, I'd see her in the corridors of the art centres and opera houses, and we, we sort of avoided each other. Until recently. And... Um, Oh no, the other really awful thing that she did was... <laughs> she didn't actually only just say that to me, but then she went up to Opera Australia and she told the musical director and some other influential people in the opera company that she told me this and that she didn't think I had enough potential to, to, do, to have a singing career, which was pretty damaging to my potentially career in opera in Australia. <laughs> But I guess I'm very grateful because it enabled me to do what I've done. But anyway, the other day, I was here visiting the cafe at Melbourne Recital Centre as part of the preparations for this conference. And I was here with my, my dear friend, Stefan Casaminos. We walked into the cafe, you know, Script Cafe just next door, Melbourne Recital Centre, and he says hello to someone at a table. And we walk over and he speaks to this gentleman and this woman says hello to me. And I look down, and this woman, oh no, I don't want to describe her in any way or name her, but she looks up at me and she says, oh, hello, Tanya. And you know, I haven't spoken to her like all these years, and it's this particular woman. And Stefan and I go off to a meeting down the road. And, uh, and I said, I really wanted to say something to her, Stefan, about what she said to me all those years ago. And he said, no, you know what you should do? Turn it around turn it around and say thank you. Say thank you to her. Because I think if she hadn't said that to you, you might not have created all these things. And see what happens and turn it around. So we went to the meeting and we came back and I said, if she's still in the cafe, I'm going to go in. <laughs> I'm going to tell her. <laughs> so I walk in the cafe and she's still there. And my heart is beating a million miles an hour. And you'd gone. <laughs> and I walk up to her, and she's sitting with the five other people. And I said, oh, hello. Look, I just wanted to say, it's been so many years since we spoke. She said, yes, it has. And I said, and I just want to say thank you so much. Thank you. Because if it hadn't have been for what you said, I might not have achieved all I have. Yeah. And she said, yes, you have achieved so much. And she's looking down and her face is beetroot red. And she would not look in my eyes. And the gentleman across the table said to her, well, what did you say? <laughs> <laughs> and she said, I'd rather not talk about it. <laughs> and with that, I left the restaurant. And a weight lifted from me. And isn't it amazing how we carry this negativity with us, while there's so much positivity around us and there's so many people that can support us and our creativity and nurture our potential, and yet we hold on to these negative moments as, they, as though they are what matters. And of course, they can be used to propel us to something far greater if we allow them to be that. So the next time someone says something to you, no, you can't, or we've done it like that before, or... This is, this is not going to work. You know how many people told me this conference was not going to work? So many people. And imagine if we listened to that all the time, there would be no innovation, because all of us would be put off. So anyway, moving on to my slides, <laughs> which I'm going to flick through very quickly. Just a reminder, who was in the opening session yesterday? You saw that slide, the recent CEO global study which showed that creativity is the most important leadership attribute over the next five years, based on a study of 1,500 CEOs across 33 sectors and 60 nations. And as you can see there, it's up there with integrity and global thinking. I believe creativity is as important as literacy and numeracy, and many of you will know about my work with The Song Room. And the other thing that I think is extremely important is about potential. 
obviously that's what I feel my passion and purpose in life is, is to help other people to unlock their potential and connect with other people who will help and support them to do that. And so if we can unlock not just obviously our intellectual intelligence, but our emotional intelligence, spiritual intelligence, social intelligence, cultural intelligence and so on, we are going to be so much more. And many of you may have seen the work of a South African academic called Cobus Needling that showed that three to five-year-olds exhibit 98% creative behaviour, reducing down to just 2% by the time we reach 25. What is happening to us? Of course, it's our education system. So we have this industrial revolution education system. And people like Sir Ken Robinson believe that we are educating people out of their creativity, and I agree with him. And in a situation where we're building a national curriculum, it is so sad that we think that we have to put everything into a certain box and that people should be taught a certain way. We're all unique individuals. And as Picasso said in that final quote on that page, we're born as artists. The challenge is to remain so as we grow up. And I don't necessarily mean that we should all be opera singers or painters or writers, but we all are creative, as that has come through the conference very strongly. So I set up the Song Room 10 years ago with a vision that all Australian children should have access to creativity in their education, not as a means to make them into stars, e.g. on Australian Idol or anything like that, but to make sure that there would be something that they could be passionate about, so that if they're not high-achieving academics, that they're at least going to achieve in another area. And you know what? When they started to achieve in music or creative, creativity of another kind, all of a sudden their results in maths and science and English have improved. All of a sudden, children who didn't want to come to school want to come to school. It really makes a difference. And the sad thing is, those statistics that three out of four Australian government primary school children don't have access to music and creativity in their education. What a national tragedy is that? And we're behind the rest of the world in this respect. We're behind every other OECD nation and behind many other third world countries as well in terms of providing a creative education to our children. So there you can see the joy. Every cell of those children's being involved, passionate, alive. And why does that matter to me? So some of you will know um, the story of my grandparents, some of you won't. But this story of creativity resonates through my whole life, is the reason why I'm here, and it certainly is the, I suppose, reason why I believe that creativity can help us to fundamentally solve any problem that we face at a personal, global or community level. So there in that photo you see my grandparents and my grandfather Karl Duldig, sculptor, grandmother Slava. The studio of Anton Hanak in Vienna, they came to as Polish migrants to study with a really great teacher. He was a contemporary of Egon Schiller and Gustav Klimt. And as you do when you're young students, they fell in love. And so one day they were walking along to the local museum of art, and you can imagine what Vienna would, would have been like in the 1920s, an absolute hotbed of cultural creativity and richness of life. And so they're walking along, it's a rainy day, and my grandmother has her big tall umbrella with her. She says to my grandfather, you know, wouldn't it be amazing if there was an umbrella that fitted in a handbag, then we wouldn't have to you know, carry this huge thing around and maybe we could you know, not leave it behind all the time. You know how you always lose your umbrella? <laughs> and there she is, pondering that question. And uh, she's got a little handbag there and I'm sure she's thinking, how can I get this handbag in here? And she said to my grandfather, let's keep this a secret. Now, like all great ideas, that idea took a while to think it through. And she visited all the lampshade shops in Vienna to try and find, you know, the spokes of those old-fashioned lampshades? And she collected them from different shops, not just from the one shop, because she didn't want to be anyone to be on to her grand plan. <laughs> Are you on to it yet? So my grandmother, um, oh, that's going to work, yes, invented the first foldable umbrella. And that is her design. And, you know, she's not an engineer, was not an engineer. She patented that 
invention as the flirt, which I think is a very lovely name for Little Umbrella. And she manufactured that very valuable idea successfully for 10 years, until 1939, when the Nazis walked into Vienna. And my grandparents were very, very fortunate to flee, literally in the nick of time, before the Nazis knocked at their door and did take away probably about half of our family on that side of the family. They fled to Switzerland because my grandfather created a portrait of the border guard and it enabled them to get a visa into Switzerland. In Switzerland, the German authorities contacted my grandmother and they said, we believe you have the patent for the first foldable umbrella. She said yes, and she said, well, we'd, we'd like to buy it from you. Being uprooted from her homeland, she had no choice but to sell the patent for the umbrella. And, um, of course, she never saw another cent from that incredibly wonderful invention. <laughs> and, of course, if she had, I'd be a billionaire and I wouldn't have to have any partners to run this conference. <laughs> but, um, anyway, suffice to say, my grandparents did escape um, via Switzerland to then Singapore to Tatura, where they were interned as enemy aliens. And my grandfather and grandmother's creative imperative was so strong that my grandfather in the internment camp, even though he didn't have any terracotta or any other artistic materials, he actually used to carve sculptures out of the potatoes. And then when he did eventually get to Melbourne, he turned some of those into little bronze and terracotta figures. They forged very successful careers, and if any of you are interested in the work of my grandparents, and to see the prototype of the original folding umbrella and my, my grandmother's notes, you can see it at the Dordig Studio in East Malvern, which is open to the public. Um, so I invite you to, to come along and see that. But suffice to say, yes, invention is definitely part of my genetic makeup. I strongly believe that we can all ask those important questions. What if? You know, what could be happening that is not happening now? So we have our Industrial Revolution Education System. And we have our information revolution, or our current lifestyle, where we talk more to boxes and screens than we do to one another. And the challenge, I believe, is about how we actually create an environment of well-being and of innovation. And in setting up Creativity Australia, I spoke to about 120 CEOs of different types of organisations across sectors, and I said, what are your two greatest challenges? Two things came up repeatedly. One was about rising rates of mental Ill health in workplaces lack of engagement, a sense of feeling that people like the company but they don't have a real sense of meaning and purpose and involvement, which I think was addressed very well this morning. And then the second thing was about innovation. We say we're innovative. You know, what company in the room doesn't say they're innovative? And yet, a lot of the CEOs said, we say we're innovative but we don't actually have a culture of innovation. We don't allow our people to think, many of them said. I thought, how can we marry these two things up between, you know, well-being and innovation? And of course, those two things are absolutely connected, um, as was mentioned so well in the previous session this morning. If you don't feel good about yourself, you're not going to bring forward your ideas. And if you can't bring forward your ideas, you're not going to feel good about yourself. So we have a values equation here that, that I created for Creativity Australia. And basically, at the bottom of the chart is increased productivity, because a lot of CEOs said to me when I set up Creativity Australia, but, yeah, I, I can see what you're saying, but what's the bottom line here? And I said, this is the bottom line. If you don't incorporate those values around inspiration, connection, caring, optimism, etc., you will not get the outcomes of teamwork and innovation and well-being and leadership that you want, and therefore you certainly won't get the productivity outcomes that you want or that you need. And that IBM study also showed that the companies that really embrace creative leadership are six times more successful than their competitors. So it's no accident, thank you, I'm coming. <laughs> it's terrible, I shouldn't have had that bell ring at all, that's embarrassing. <laughs> I set the time limit. It's embarrassing, isn't it? Um, but, you know, a number of the companies here, like ANZ and Telstra and, and um, who's here, like CSC, Three of our major sponsors have creativity and innovation offices or senior executives that are, that are working in those companies. Anyway, uh, click. Oh, As you all know, we've set up all these choirs. I'm not going to talk about it now. It's a very powerful project. Who came to the choirs concert the other night? Did you find it powerful? Yeah, just beautiful. Bridging social capital, embracing diversity, 
The more diversity you can get, the more the diversity of your conversation is, sorry, the more diverse the conversation is, the better. There's no point just pe speaking to people who, who think and feel and look the same as you. We have to all have the most diverse conversations we possibly can, and that's why we set up those choirs. It was absolutely to create more than choirs, to build social capital, self-esteem, a sense of belonging, and eventually employment pathways. So finally, the key points. Um, and I'll, I'll email this to you if any of you want and can't write it down in the time. The power of no. We are all far more creative than we believe. And we must not put self-limiting beliefs on ourselves or others around us, if possible. Ask why, ask why not, what if, look for possibility always. Create for value. Focus on the benefits and value of your idea, not the newness. And I think Dr. De Bono announced that many, many times. Diversity. I've just mentioned it. Creating a culture of innovation within your organisation. Find any way so that you have the courage to keep going or otherwise leave. Inquiring minds, like my grandmother, all it takes is nurturing inquiring minds. Courage. Courage is probably the most important thing. If you don't have courage, there is no point having an idea you've got to be able to deliver that idea to its end result. And as Michael Rennie said this morning, be a bit mad and totally driven. Otherwise, that wonderful idea that you have will probably not see the light of day. And finally, um, I think I skipped one anyway. <laughs> um, oh, there's courage, there we are. Um, listening plus creativity plus courage plus passion equals the power to change. So ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to leave you with two quotes. Sing like no one's listening, love like you've never been hurt, dance like no one's watching, and live like it's heaven on earth, by Mark Twain. And then finally, Rabbi Hillel, who said, if I'm not for myself, who will be for me? And if I'm only for myself, what am I? And if not now, when? Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. <laughs>